The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the News Hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm your host, Michael McAuliffe, and with me in the studio today is a longtime friend and activist in the marijuana movement in Nevada and beyond, Pierre Warner. How hey guys, yeah. how you doing? All right. Well, we're, we're, you know, how as you doing, Mike? I, it's an honor really to be well. on your show. You know, it, it's it's uh, yeah, it's been it's been a while since we've been together. So, uh, yeah. you know, uh, but we've been through a lot. We have been through a lot. Yeah. You know, uh, so has this movement. And yet, in some ways, uh, as I said on the ride over, it's uh, um, it's almost like we're back where we started from some years ago. You know, as I was pulling uh, news stories together for today's show okay. uh, and and looking from Colorado and Montana and California and, and here in Nevada, I, I, I'm thinking of, of, you know, what a history, what we have seen in the course of this movement over the last 15 years. Yeah. When when we met uh, was during the uh, original uh, uh, campaign to legalize marijuana back then. Maybe. I think it was question nine uh, back in 2002. And uh, their offices were over on Sahara. And I remember mm -hmm. meeting you there then. And uh, uh, along with others who have been involved with this fight in the long term, uh, including Chris G., uh, uh, County Commissioner, 2003, Chris, right? Uh, that was um, the that was actually the so, the spring and summer of 2002 because that's when okay. the elections were. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Chris Jim wow. Kiliani had just uh, uh, was still in the legislature and had just shepherded that bill through. And we thought great things were going to happen, and unfortunately, it's taken. Yeah. taken a while wow. and it's not without sacrifice that no. these things have happened none of these things ever happen we sacrificed easily. a lot um, with, without we a the doubt pioneers you know that I've heard that from other people actually yeah. it's funny. so as I'm, I'm looking at this we'll, we'll touch on a few of these things you know but when when we first met back in 2002 you were just uh, at that point that was pre doctor reefer and you were just looking to be active and and make a dis difference in this and why did you first get involved with uh, the marijuana reform movement well the legalization of marijuana has always been special to me uh, I had a high school friend at 14 that uh, his parents put him into a rehab and it was just because we were smoking pot, chasing girls, and lifting weights. You know, we weren't doing anything else. And I thought it was wrong, and I wanted to change that. And then, you know, I got into selling marijuana, even uh, international, mm -hmm. when I got uh, popped in uh, New Jersey with 170-something pounds. And then when I got out of there, that was in 2000, and when I got out of there, I got out in 2001. I was there for eight months four days, something like that. And uh, I got out there, and Nevada had just legalized it for medical reasons. And I said, you know what? I'm cool with that. If you'll let me be legal, I'll just sell uh, to medical marijuana patients. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I inf got informed through the process that you have to, the patients have to have that ID. So I started getting them legal. And then little by little, uh, you know, I just built up a company. But I kept everything medical. And it was so we because there was a need legal. out there. You know, oh, yeah. what, what Nevada did was the people voted to have a, a medical marijuana system in place whereby people could... Um, could have a supply, and it's right in the constitutional amendment for for um, appropriate methods of supply for authorized patients. And so everybody thought that back after it was voted on in 2000 that we were going to get dispensaries at that point because that was the logical uh, next step forward. Uh, because you couldn't expect these people who are uh, who are very ill to be uh, to be 
farmers essentially and producing their own medicine uh, and so we knew at that point that there was a need for more of it and in some of those early uh, Department of Agriculture hearings uh, they were very skeptical about the need for a professional class yeah. uh, you know and they were worried about a whole bunch of drug dealers coming in and taking over and, and, and then I showed up too <laughs> and then you showed up you know and, and but uh, you remember though the the state law where you could possess one ounce and grow seven plants sure but you couldn't buy it anywhere right uh and what if you were uh paralyzed paraplegic you know the being told to make your own aspirin mm -hmm. it was just a ludicrous law and you know we tried to fight it and we fought it and you know uh and and I eventually state, i was nevada's first uh patient to go to state prison for for medical marijuana for medical marijuana? Uh, absolutely. For my grow houses. Absolutely. And, you know, back at that time, uh, the Department of Agriculture was running the program, and they were they were very concerned uh, that the federal government was going to come in and raid, because at that point we had a, just a, a newly elected uh, Republican president with a extremely conservative Republican you know? attorney general who was very anti-pot, and the feds were going around and, and raiding these different uh, facilities in states uh, around the country. Country. And of course, at the at the same time that Nevada got its program started in 2000, within a couple of months of that, Colorado also began their medical marijuana program. So uh, Nevada at that time had was not was not the first uh, by any means uh, to to move into this area. And there were guidelines in place from some of these other states, but it was still a very um, rough and ready. Uh, you know, just kind of figure it out as you're going. Even even a few years after that, when we went to Colorado in 2009, all you had to do was go down to City Hall, pay 20 bucks, and get a business license, and you were a medical marijuana dispensary, or you were a, a cultivator, or, or that sort of thing. Mike, and, Mike, and it worked at that time. I remember that uh, I even came to you and I told you about this, and I said, hey man, how about uh, helping me find, because I had just gotten out of uh, state prison like eight months before that. So I was kind of uh, hurting on cash, and I said, how about you uh, help me, you know, finance a trip for me. I'll go scout out, you know, Colorado and give you a full report. Mm -hmm. And you gave me like 500 bucks and said, yeah, give me a full <laughs> yeah, no. report. Yeah. And well. I remember calling you, get your you know but down here man this is unbelievable you can walk into city hall with twenty dollars and get a business license mm -hmm. i mean it was easy it was for the taking and you know i did that uh, dispensary in boulder denver mm -hmm. you did the one in uh, colorado, colorado springs, springs. Mm -hmm. and uh and and it, it, it was good and actually i would say that um as compared to my experience here in Nevada, working with patients, which was a very much one-on-one -on -one situation because mm -hmm. of, of the way things are structured here, that uh, going to Colorado was really kind of eye-opening because I, I got to see the business from a whole nother perspective because now all of a sudden it was a dispensary and now you weren't dealing with the, the same patients, you know, and you knew what their condition was and, and you might go visit them at their home you know, or whatever, you know. I'll be honest with you, man. I never gave a shit, you know. <laughs> Well, I, I wouldn't say that, the, but this, because this, some, is, this some, is one some, of America's prime pot activists. So, some of the some of the people, you know, they really did need it. Yes. But some of the other ones didn't. And, you know, when I was in state prison, man, in uh, high desert state prison, mm -hmm. and my silly was a murderer, I remember being so fuming mad. And I said, okay, you sons of bitches, you're going to put me in prison for growing the marijuana for the sick people. Okay. When I get out of here, I'm going to legalize everybody in the state of Nevada because nobody should be in prison for a plant. Absolutely true. And so I don't care what your condition is. You know, I really don't want to hear your story because I got so much stuff to do on my own. That, mm -hmm. You know, people want to take my time and tell me everything. I don't have to. You, ha you can fight for their rights without necessarily yeah. having to read their biography. Yeah, and putting yeah. a dispensary up is like putting a flag up, you know. And Very saying, much so. You know, we're here. We're legal. We're just like any other business, uh, and 
we deserve to be open. Yes, absolutely. And and according to the state of Nevada, uh, there was a need. And, and one of the reasons that we were comfortable fighting this battle at the time was because uh, here in Nevada, we knew that, that them prohibiting dispensaries or them uh, prohibiting uh, the actual sale or supply of cannabis to medical patients was unconstitutional. And ultimately, it yeah. got proven that way. You know, and, and unfortunately, uh, that that situation doesn't help when you have the federal government coming in. And, and just to clarify yeah. uh, for our audience, um, you, you, you talked uh, about prison and going to jail as a medical marijuana patient and all that. Uh, Any time that you've been incarcerated, your your uh, your um, conviction uh, history is all based on on it's it's all marijuana. It's all medical marijuana. It's not well, you know, with the exception of New Jersey, that 170 pounds. Oh, okay. well, that was well, that was still marijuana. Though. That was still okay. marijuana. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as as if uh, you you were uh, going in a direction that most of the American people don't already agree with. I mean, a recent uh, survey just a couple of months before the election uh, by Time Magazine showed that 60 percent of Americans now favor the legalization of marijuana. And with the result of Election Day, we've got roughly a quarter of the people in the country living in uh, legalization or medical marijuana states, and and now we have. Um, 29 states with medical marijuana programs, closer to 40 if you include the CBD programs. Uh, yeah, we. Uh, uh, it's it's incredible how it's we're winning gone. this battle. Yeah, because then uh, you know after Colorado, when uh, I came back after Colorado passed that law that no convicted felons can own a dispensary, I had to sell. They passed that law yeah. where you had to be a resident retroactively, mm -hmm. and that kicked you out. Mm -hmm. um, so then when I came back and, you know, we got into the raids here, mm -hmm. I remember being in uh, federal prison for that one. And then uh, when the voters legalized it in Oregon, mm -hmm. or no, Colorado. it was Washington and yeah. Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, yeah, they can't stop us, you know. And yeah. even the billboards, I mean, they weren't down. I was basically running my business, but from prison. Yeah. You know. So I, I remember after after the raids in 2010 that um, you know people were were justifiably angry and uh, a group of us about 60 of us or so went down to the county commission about three weeks after the raids mm -hmm. and I I, I, I gave a fiery speech there on uh, on our patients our rights our, our you know our duties you know uh, and, and that and and uh, I, I sort of closed with a with a, a quote attributed to Gandhi that uh, first they ignore you then they laugh at you then they fight you then they win and I said well they, they did that they did that and you know and so now they're fighting us so that means we're gonna win soon and you know, of course, uh, in the in the aftermath of those raids, uh, certain federal officers would say to me, "Aha! It doesn't look like you're winning now." And blah blah blah, you know, <laughs> smartass. Uh, but in fact, we have yeah. we, we have won this you battle. Know what? In the this guy right of the here American is people. the prime example of fighting. You know, and <laughs> if you don't know his history and how hard he fought, you know, against mm -hmm. the government, which is. He's the number one reason for me, in my mind, for the legalization of all drugs, because it all should be legal and regulated, and uh, nobody should be imprisoned for responsible use of whatever you want to use. And, and for those of you uh, who, who don't have eagle eyes, this is, uh, this is Pablo Escobar, who is certainly a controversial figure uh, here in North America. The world's biggest gangster. The world's <laughs> biggest gangster, or was, was. Uh, at, at one point. But um, he was what he did actually uh, in his local community uh, was so yeah. philanthropic that he was seen as a big benefactor a down saint. there and He's seen uh, as a saint. yes but uh, larger forces outside his immediate area determined he was a danger and went yeah, after him and that, and that's what the federal government did when they came in here into Nevada and started raiding dispensaries yeah. they're, they're an outside force that said oh no this is a big problem and it really it was not a problem uh, other a dispensary uh, yeah I mean Give yeah. me a break. And we were helping people, sick people. Like, it's sick of the government that they came in and, and really... Uh I, I think it's more that they were at wits end and that they were they were generally law-abiding people. They were trying to get But they, like, they were trying to get This was organized there. because, you know, there were 50 other dispensaries. I'm talking about the patients. I'm talking oh. about the patients being at wits end. I'm talking about who ordered the raid. Because this, oh. this was a political... Um, 
without a doubt, Conspiracy. the best information I've gotten over the last five years, six years, is that these these raids were instigated uh, at the behest of of uh, the Metropolitan Police Department because sheriff. they realized yes, and sheriff uh, uh, sheriff. Uh, uh, young at that time, yeah. right? Uh, or, or and 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 anyway, and Jerry Keller, and um, yeah, they realized and that they were not going to be able to get these convictions under state law, mm -hmm. and, and so they turned to the federal government and said, "Oh, please help us." Conspired with the United States Attorney General is what they did, Mike, because uh, they targeted us. Well, I, I, it's only I, I think it's only conspiracy if they if they prove it in a court of law that that you did something illegal and. That's never going to happen with those guys. But, but indeed, there was a, there was uh, an organized uh, uh, movement between local police authorities who brought in the federal government. And when they came in to raid these dispensaries uh, back in September of 2010, uh, it was not only the um, uh, the police, the Metropolitan Police Department, or the um, uh, or the DEA, but they had they IRS. had Henderson cops, <laughs> they had the IRS criminal investigators. In, investigative division in there. They had North Las Vegas cops. They had Henderson cops. They had everybody who wanted to make a little extra overtime yeah, come in did. that day because they, they raided 15 separate places uh, in that one day. And uh, that was that was just a crazy time. Hey, I'll tell you what, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back in just a minute and talk a little bit about some of the news of the day. All right. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency, all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing Digipath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service, consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the Digipath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijin, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. And welcome yeah. back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm your host, Mike McAuliffe, with my guest Dr. in the studio Reefer. today, Dr. Reefer, the original Dr. Reefer Pierre Warner. Um, all right, you know, taking a look at some of the news that's around here, we, we were just mentioning before the break Colorado, and I have an article here from our friend Eric Stanley over at Hemp News uh, that uh, notes that Colorado has now passed a uh, billion dollars in sale of, of marijuana products in 2016. And wow. um, it says here that uh, roughly $1.1 billion in legal sales of legal recreational and medical marijuana were sold by the end of October, according to the tax data released from the state's Department of Revenue. Uh, 2015 saw a total sales of $996 million, according to reports from the state. So what this is saying is that um, in the first 10 months of the year, they've already gone they've already exceeded by 10% what they did in the entire 2015 year and uh, they still had two more two more months to go and uh, further on in the article it says that they expected to uh, take in 1.3 billion for the year uh, and that Colorado has collected more than 150 million dollars in taxes from legal marijuana sales through October 2016 the first 40 million being allocated to school projects and this mm. is, this is something that I see mm. a lot in these yeah schools right mm. uh, and and 
uh, when the Nevada uh, Question 2 initiative got done, a number of these, uh, they would say, oh, we're going to give the money to the schools, we're going to give the money to the schools. And then later on, when the state gets their hands on it and decides, well, we don't want to give so much money, we want to put it into the slush fund so we yeah. can use it for other things, you know, that's fine. But, but a lot of the people who have been opposed to this on the other side of the fence before this November election were saying, oh, well, not much is going to education and this money is being, you know, sent to other places, so it's not really helping the kids, so they're lying to you, so don't vote for it. And obviously that, that you know, that argument You know, my flat. argument to that is like, oh, yeah, well, how much does uh, alcohol or cigarettes contribute to, your, you know, school education? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, it's ridiculous. Why should it? Why should it? Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, there's the argument made that we've cut smoking by over 30% in the last 30 years by a campaign of education, by a campaign of, of telling, of letting people know it's bad for them, letting them know what the health effects are and this and that. So to that a degree, waste of my taxpayer education. money, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that is your libertarian right here in the state of Nevada, <laughs> if not the United States anymore. Uh, we'll see. But, you know, uh, even even so with this, collecting $150 million in taxes and $40 million Bam, being allocated. Bam, that is a lot 40, of 40 money. $40 million allocated to school. I, I'm sure any school district would like to get a chunk of money mm -hmm. like that. And, and $150 million in taxes is fine because, you know, it's but not see, look, as Mike, if— you're yeah. look, you're never going to convince the haters. You know, like uh, there was a— a guy on my Twitter, um, he follows TikTok, Pat Hickam. Pat Hickey? Pat State, Hickey, yeah. State senator, yeah. yeah, yeah. Assemblyman, yeah. So he always complained about, oh, they're not, the, the schools aren't going to get enough taxes, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah? But you're collecting $160 million in taxes? That's what that what yeah, they yeah, just yeah, collected, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, and that's the first ten months. Yep. Like, come on, you yep. know, how much more do you want, you bloodsuckers? And he's a Republican too, and he always fights against taxes, you know. Yes. But then when it's marijuana, oh, oh let's, let's tax let's the tax. living hell out of them. Yes. Yes. Give me a break. And, and that's what happened here uh, when, in 2013 with the dispensaries. The Republicans were, were all, about, oh, no new taxes. You know, we don't want to raise taxes mm. on anybody. But because Hypocrites. these dispensaries were considered an entirely new business and new industry, it's a new form of revenue so they can support taxing all the, all the patients and the, and the pot smokers yeah. without having to, uh, to say they've raised taxes on anybody because they've created mm. a new tax. So yeah. it, it's, just, it's just political. And I'm glad the friendly. voters of Nevada, you know, leave legalized it recreationally. Absolutely. You know? Because yeah. this is, it's just nonsense. It well, really as you is. said earlier, no, nobody nobody should go to jail or, or have a legal record or have their life otherwise harmed right. uh, by their interactions with a plant. Yeah. I mean, you know. Or with any substance, really, man. I mean, if you can control yourself and be, you know, whatever you want to be behind your closed doors or out in public even, I mean, that's what they have bars for. Yeah. You know, and now in Colorado, Washington, and some other places, they're... Um, trying to be able to consume in public just as anything else you know if you're intoxicated you get a taxi or you, you find a friend to drive sure. you home you sure. know, and you use it responsibly there's no reason anybody who steals or hurts or you know uh, kills people yeah you deserve to be in prison sure but if you want to use responsibly like drinking a beer or whatever, knock yourself out, whatever yeah. you, you use. You shouldn't go to prison or jail or anything and, and else. And speaking about drinking a beer, Colorado's governor, John Hinkenlooper, of course, uh, was a, a member of the Coors uh, beer family. And so he made his money uh, selling selling booze yeah. to people. And they opposed right? marijuana. And, and he opposed marijuana, said it was a terrible idea, it was awful, he would, you know, what he uh, he campaigned against it in 2012, and now, four years later, he's saying, you know, well, maybe that wasn't a bad thing. He said, yeah. you know, if... if $160 million in tax revenue. Just for, mm. just for one year, yeah. I mean, it's not such a bad uh, thing. Exactly. And, uh, you know, he says now that uh, his issue is that maybe they didn't regulate edibles enough at oh. the start. Uh, oh. but, but other than that, he's, he's happy with it. And, and so, you know, that shows that you can convert people who were uh, against it at, at one point in time. Uh, when when we, we went up there in uh, the fall of 09 and uh, through the first half of 10, uh, uh, there were a lot of people out there who wanted to help others, who were doing it for the right reasons. I, I you know, in Colorado Springs, we, we found I, I remember all of that sort of stuff. I remember I offered you uh, Dr. Reefer Denver. <laughs> You'll always be Dr. Reefer to me. <laughs> you know, 
No, no, you're the you're the original Doctor Reefer. I'm, I'm 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 happy to let you have that one. But um, you're Doctor Reefer. You know too. the thing the thing is that uh, in Colorado uh, they took a, a much more sensible approach than they took here in Nevada. Oh yeah. And and they ultimately uh, once the Supreme Court decided that dispensaries had a right to exist, uh, they they opened up. Uh, uh, you know, kind of with open arms because they, they really allowed the business to flourish and they didn't put it under great scrutiny. I remember one time I was in uh, in Denver at, at the dispensary and that, that, I, that I had uh, and uh, somebody threw a rock through the window at midnight and the cops called us and everything and I was staying at some motel down the street or whatever. We were really kind of pioneering it there and uh, came back and, you know, the cops took the report. They were friendly. We had to we had the medical marijuana, some growing in the back, and we had we had our meds there. And and the police were absolutely polite, professional. They they had no. Yeah, issues that was with shocking, wasn't? It? Because I remember I had a similar issue where I beat up the burglar that uh, tried oh, I that tried that. to yeah, buy. Yeah, that was the, you know, the news and everything. Yeah, yeah. And then you know they wanted to come in and interview me and ask me what happened, and I was like, you know, uh, I'm a dispensary. You know that, right? Yeah. Are you sure you you're cool about coming down here into my dispensary? Yeah. They're like, yeah, man, we just want to do a report. You're cool. You're legal. Yep. Yep. I was like, wow. Okay. Come on and, down. And at that time, you know, part of part of uh, being an entrepreneur and, and building a business and and you, you're trying to put all your sweat equity into a place is that uh, you really uh, live, breathe uh, the yeah. ex entire experience. And so the case that you're referring to was because at your dispensary in Boulder, you were actually in those opening days, you were actually sleeping there. You had a you had a big basement in this place, beautiful space, three thousand uh, square feet the biggest dispensary in Boulder, Colorado. At the time, And yeah. remember, Mike, I took my king-size bed from Vegas, and when I moved to Colorado, like, uh, I rented an a apartment, too, but it had, like, a single or a twin or something like that, and I put, I just put the king-size down, down in the basement. I thought, eh, sometimes, you know, if I get, if I have too much to drink, I could just pass out there or right. whatever. And you know what? I liked actually sleeping in my dispensary. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was cool. And, like, well, yeah, you were sleeping you know? in a room with your plants, so you were getting plenty of oxygen. <laughs> and what happened, as as, as quite often does, is uh, somebody uh, thought, oh, a medical marijuana place, this is an easy score. And so in the middle of the night, they tried to force the back door and break in, and they obviously thought the place was empty, and <laughs> you you gave them a little waffle. Yeah. I beat the hell out of that one guy. And and the you other made, one ran away. And then you you made the local news and local and, and national and national yeah. and um, I needed that too because yeah. uh, I didn't have money for advertising. And after that, that that made me a legend in Colorado. <laughs> I had people coming to my dispensary just to shake my hand. I, I, I don't know if I'd go over legend. I mean, Charlie Brown didn't like you. And Charlie Brown, besides being a comic book character, which yeah. in some ways he was, uh, was, was also, a, a, I believe, a state senator in Colorado. No, Charlie was Brown was a Denver? Uh, Denver city councilman. City councilman. But there was a, a state senator, too, that, you know, these politicians, man, I got a picture of all three of us in some convention uh, that was in Denver, where we're all smiling all, and, and, you know, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, that one guy, the state senator, turned around and pushed for the felony law. Yeah. You know, which excluded me. And, and, and they, and they mentioned you specifically yeah. sometimes. We don't need Dr. <laughs> Reefer coming in from out of state and oh, doing all yeah. this stuff. And Big so gangster much, from Las Vegas. Oh, my God. And yeah. And there were so many people coming into Colorado at the time, just as, as are, are happening here in Nevada now, uh, to take advantage of this. So it, it's amazing how it's okay in so many other different areas, but mm -hmm. not over yeah. here. So, you know, at the same time that all this was going on up there, Montana had also passed a medical marijuana law. And uh, roughly at the time when we were having the, the, the problems down here in the federal raids in Nevada, uh, Montana was experiencing its own issues because people had opened up dispensaries there and were trying to help out. And um, so the, the state went in and they raided these people. They put them out of business. They really strangled the program. Uh, the, um, Even the feds. Yeah. Because I was locked up with some guy from Montana. And yep. he was uh, he worked at one of the dispensaries. So yep. and and so and, and what, that point is valid because it's not only a case of the people who owned these facilities, but the they workers. actually put the workers in jail. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and I, I remember one of um, uh, uh, 
Johnny Bermeil's uh, workers uh, from the, the Happiness Consultant, which was one of the places that got raided in 2010. Um, uh, a couple of years later, he was he was sitting out in, in a in that. Uh, federal holding facility in Pahrump and he had been there for some months and he was just a low level nobody and so the idea that they that they were jamming him up and it's it's not even as if they were trying to get him to roll over on somebody because at that time all the defendants from 2010 had already taken plea deals including this guy and uh, they just decided that that they didn't like him and, and they put him in jail for a few months more and yeah, scary, scary situation. The government is uh, really, you know, the people running the United States District Attorney's Office, they're really petty, man. I mean, uh, and they have so much power to charge you for whatever they want. They're mm -hmm. really just going after statistics to, you know, show that they're working. In when, man, they, they're taking up time, you know, that could be... Uh, Missing with murders, rapists, robbers. But you see, murder, rape, and in general robbery are not federal crimes. Those are all state or local level issues. The federal government rarely, rarely gets involved with murder okay. unless it's conspiracy to murder somebody like a John Gotti or, or something like that. But by and large, the, the feds stay out of those crimes. Uh, okay, you know, by and well, large, but still, though, the feds usually take on the more serious. Um, that's the, yeah, that's the idea. And they're backed up like at least two years, two to three years. Mm -hmm. If everybody actually went to trial, uh, it'd be backed up for like 90 if, years if is, every, is what I've... I, I read that um, according to the Wall Street Journal okay. that, um, that over 95% of all cases in this country now are plea bargained. Mm -hmm. uh, and of those that go to trial, roughly 96% of them result in convictions. And so the, the system seems to be very stacked. I, I cannot believe that it's just the case that, that law enforcement across the country is so good they only arrest the guilty people and they only go after those people who are serious trouble and they they get them get them and that's why they're able to convict them personally uh i've seen that there are a lot of people who just get jammed up in a system that that doesn't care that that's very petty and you know you're talking about the u.s attorneys uh i i've read in in legal writings that they're considered the 93 u.s attorneys in this country are considered the 93 most powerful people in the country mm -hmm. because they they operate on general guidelines from the attorney general but within their district like here in the state of nevada or there are four districts in california mm -hmm. what they say goes and if yeah. they want to make somebody's life hell, they can do it. Oh, and yeah. that is indeed what happened here in Nevada with some of these people because they were not... Yeah, with um, us. Yeah, they, <laughs> they were not uh, violent people. They're not bad people. You're trying to help sick people, and you get the full weight of the federal government. It's a, a uh, scary meat thing. meat grinder. Uh, it, it absolutely is. Hey, we're going to take another quick break and then come back with our guest, the original Dr. Reefer, Pierre Werner. Stick with us. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999 at 702-979-9999 or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a Nevada... 
medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency, all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing Digipath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the Digipath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. And we're back with the Nevada Medical... Well, well, here I am. I'm looking. I'm reading, uh, reading the first story about a medical marijuana bill, the Nevada uh, Cannabis News Hour. Um, anyway, so in, in Mexico, okay. uh, they're, they're moving forward. And, you know, uh, Mexico was watching this the American election. I, I think they were half watching it for Donald Trump and the big wall and half watching it for our drug policy. Yeah. And certainly since the results uh, have come across, we have seen... Uh, officials in Mexico saying that uh, they want to move towards legalization. They were looking to see what California did, and it's such a huge market that Mexico seems to be moving uh, in a similar direction. And we have... Uh, I've been keeping my eyes on them because my mom did move to Mexico. Oh, did she? she? Yeah, she lives in Playa del Carmen right now. Hmm. Well, you know, there, there may be stuff happening there because uh, Mexico may soon have a legal medical marijuana uh, industry available for people. Uh, after its Senate now passed new legislation this past Tuesday, to approve cannabis really? use for qualified patients. I yes, didn't hear about that the one. bill, which was submitted to Congress by President Enrique Peña Nieto early this year, must still must be approved by the lower house before medical marijuana becomes legal in Mexico. Now, one of the, one of the things that struck me about finding this is that it was the president who submitted this bill to Congress and said, "Hey, we need to do that." Wow, what a concept! Well, we don't do that in this country. Well, no, 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 no. Though he wouldn't have done it though if uh, the Supreme Court didn't rule. That or personal possession was not yeah, was was not constitutional and, and against it was unconstitutional the constitution. to make laws against personal possession. Yeah, yeah and so absolutely. there were like four patients in some organization that sued the government, and they have the right to cultivate, mm -hmm. uh, transport, consume. I don't think they have the to sell, mm -hmm. but they have all those three. So. Mm -hmm. They knew that they were going to get pushed in that direction, and that's why the president came up with this and probably said, you know, who wants to pay for my political uh, re-election? Yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe so, but it's still, it's a good move. It and, is, uh, it definitely you know, is. If you think that the entire country of Mexico uh, might become a, a medical marijuana zone, uh, that's that's a lot of people. That's that's a lot of territory. Yeah. And, you know, even and it though... it changes a lot of laws, because in Mexico, yeah. they're really uh, against the... The legalization of marijuana, really, in general. I think the the majority. But I think we're going to see that happen too, with, with what's happening. Oh yeah, we'll in see it happen. Yeah. But ju just that, you know, the Supreme Court justices ruled in the mar medical marijuana favor, just shows you a lot that really intelligent people who have no, who have heard the arguments and have seen the evidence, you know, it should be legal. This is so ridiculous. It, it, it is. And, you know, I, I'm heartened by the fact that not only Mexico, but uh, much of Latin America and South America are moving away from mm -hmm. the U.S. drug war rhetoric. And they're, they're essentially saying now that, you know, you're forcing us into doing this. We're paying the price from this with, with all the deaths down here and, and, mm -hmm. and the poverty that, that comes from, from the corruption that mm -hmm. these people engender. Uh, and, you know, you Americans are up there. You're just getting high and having fun. <laughs> You're not paying, uh, you know, any of the consequences yeah. that we are. Yeah, well, I, I know, I know, I know. But uh, keep sending you know, us our, your drugs. But <laughs> but that but that is is a viewpoint that's prevalent down there. Yeah. And um, so they're starting to to rail against it, especially when you have states like Washington and Oregon and 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 Colorado, Alaska, uh, which for several years now Nevada. have had legalization in place. And yeah. and so hmm, it's how uh, come it's legal over there while we keep confiscating and locking up these poor people over here. So I see I see another story here that that's uh, not Mexico, a little bit closer to home, but, right. but actually, you know, other side of the country. In Massachusetts, which we've been following uh, for the past couple of months during the uh, the 
the election season, and we know that Massachusetts also voted to legalize in uh, in November. Uh, and for medical, right? Uh, no, this is uh, legalization, recreational. We we uh, we were on the ballot uh, in four states and uh, five states, and passed in four of them. Only Arizona failed this this November. Okay. Um, but uh, in Massachusetts, uh, we have the S Senate president, state Senate president, uh, Stan Rosenberg, who happens to be a Democrat, has said Tuesday that he would be interested in raising the legal smoking age for marijuana under state mm -hmm. law to 25. <laughs> and, and he admits that this is his idea alone. Maybe maybe he was taking too much too yeah. deep of a hit in the back room or something like that. And nobody uh, and, donated to his campaign. Yeah. He said, I feel obligated to put this on the table and have it discussed, even if the decision is to stick with 21. And he says that the reason for this was because uh, he's read things saying that the human brain continues developing oh. until 25 years old, and so you don't want to have those poor 24-year-olds lose out on those last extra That is such a cells. ridiculous argument, Mike. <laughs> and they use this all the time. All the time. That, like, I actually want to see this because I've been smoking pot since I was 13, you know, and I know most of my friends are in the same boat, and this this is just complete nonsense. Not only that, but we used acid back in those days, you know, and so many other drugs mm -hmm. in my teenage years, you know. Of that, course. That if that was true, I'd be retarded by now. <laughs> and, and actually, you know, and, and they said, oh, you know, you, you smoke pot, you're going to kill brain cells. Yeah. You drink alcohol, you're going to kill brain cells. They're dying every day. Cells. They're dying every day, but they're also getting replaced. And I, I've read uh, things within the past several months, uh, medical articles showing that some of the cannabinoids in cannabis help actually them. help the brain mm -hmm. build new cells. Yeah. So it's just the opposite. It's, it's the same false argument that See, they've been making propaganda. for years with the gateway theory. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, pot, you're going to use pot. And it's and gonna you're going to be a heroin addict. Heroin addict <laughs> longer, right? And what we're finding this is, is the your brain on drugs. In the other direction, <laughs> that more people are using pot as an exit from yeah. opioids uh -huh. than are leading them into opioid use. Yeah. So, yeah, this and there's is, data on that, too. And there is, We're not just talking about that. that. Stuff. And, and so for this guy to say, oh, I think we should raise the... Yeah. I was against legalization, but utilize legal <laughs> So now I want to stop people who are under a quarter century old yeah. from, from smoking it. You know, and let oh, those but older you're people. 18 and you're eligible to go to the war? Yeah. Go ahead, bud. We'll let you go die for your country. Yeah. You know, we'll let you go get cancer at 21 from cigarettes and, you know, yeah. drive drive blind drunk if you if you choose to. But you're, you're not no capable of... No smoking marijuana for you. But it's Youngster. not going anywhere. But <laughs> Youngster. It's just, it just goes to show what we're fighting against. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It so, is ridiculous. You know, it, it's absolutely nuts. So let's see. What else do we have here that, that I find interesting? You, we talk about criminal issues here. Okay. Um, uh, here's uh, from uh, U.S. News and World Reports. Their staff writer, Stephen Nelson, uh, wrote that reformers say that figures from the first full year of retail sales uh, say that there's no surprise that drug mail has dropped after pot stores open. <laughs> and I've, I've known for decades that people, you know, would, would send little packages from California uh, yeah. or from Florida uh, to different areas and, and they, you know, and, and, I've and sent a few little, time. little greenery uh, <laughs> shows up in, in somebody's mailbox. Right. And apparently statistics provided to U.S. News and World Report by the U.S. Postal Inspection Service All show right. that marijuana package intercepts declined again in the year uh, t fiscal year 2015, the first annual period that wholly encompasses state-regulated recreational marijuana sales in Colorado and Washington State. And uh, basically, this uh, there's a two-year pattern here, 2014-2015, where there were there um, getting less uh, uh, less intercepts, but uh, they're indicating that apparently they're not slacking off in their in their attempts to interdict this stuff, but apparently as we have pot legal in more states, there's less mailing around mm, of the country of because people don't want to be a criminal. Well, of course not. If they, if and if you make it easy for the consumer, mm -hmm. hey, I don't have to buy it in the, you know, interweb or whatever else they go. They can just go down to their local store. <laughs> yeah. Why? I, and you get to choose what kind of quality you get, you know, so... Oh. And so yes, and so for that, why would you why would you have a, a friend across the country send you a half pound or, or whatever amount it's going to be of something that you haven't you haven't 
looked at, you haven't smelled, you haven't tried, and, and yeah, all exactly. of a sudden you're going to be stuck with a, a, no a, a larger amount. So, yeah, it, it's not surprising. What really surprises me about this is how these people in official positions can be so clueless about this these simple economic cause and effects. We did a story last week that we covered uh, with uh, NIDA d director Dr. Nora Volkow, uh, and they were talking about uh, the teen use and the fact that, uh, that use uh, eighth graders, 12th graders are, are using less cannabis now, and as it's becoming legal in more markets, the teen use is dropping, it's no longer the forbidden fruit, and all this sort of stuff. And so we, we see the teen use is going down, um, and, but Dr. Volko says, I, I don't know what to say about this. I had no idea of this. We expected all the results to go in the other direction. So it just shows how clueless these people yeah. really are when it comes to this policy that they're supposed to be such esteemed professionals at and people who we are paying large amounts of tax money to dictate these yeah. policies and they don't have a friggin' clue. They really don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. with that, I have a clue that we, we need to stay on the air and take care of our bills. So please listen to these words from our fine advertisers, and we'll be right back. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijan, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. And welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Uh, and here we are with our guest today, the original Dr. E for Pierre Werner. Hi. And you know, you have you've been through so much in in the state of Nevada and and beyond. And I, I I've talked to you over the years, and you said, "I'm getting out of this. I'm done with this. This you know." People don't understand what I'm trying to do. And you really were focused on a message that, that got you multiple convictions and got you multiple stints Five. in jail. And, and, you know, really, this was all about pot. And, and f for the vast majority of this, you were, actually, you were helping people who were suffering. And, yeah. and you know, and, and what, do you, what do you get from that? Uh, I'm a five-time uh, convicted felon, certified career criminal. Wow. Dr. Reefer. <laughs> what more is there to say about that? Um, so then, let, let me ask: what what is uh, what, what's the future hold for for Dr. Right, Reefer? So where, where are you going from here? As you know, uh, the state, federal, or the state government and the federal government now has made it extremely tough for me, like to be in the marijuana business in uh, the United States. Like, if until they legalize it federally. Uh, if I go, you know, if I own a dispensary or grow up, whatever it is in, in whatever state that it's legal, the feds can still come in and raid me, take mm -hmm. everything. And this time, because of my career criminal You'll have status, a enhancement? if not more, man, I'm yeah. probably looking at life in prison. Hmm. So I do not want to go that route. Um, I started an internet company selling stuff online. And I've done really well with that. And I don't need to go into the marijuana business or well, a, the, Tommy the, any kind of business. Tommy sold stuff online that wasn't pot, and they, they still put him in jail. Yeah, but that was a, you know, marijuana, paraphernalia supposedly pipes, paraphernalia, yeah. yeah. So I'm selling T-shirts and stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know. So I'm 
making sure that I can't, I'm not going to break any laws that, you know, I can face life in prison. So what I, I decided to do, you know, was keep an eye out of where it is, uh, because marijuana still is my passion and I do want to advance the cause. So I've kept it, you know, countries where it's legal federally so that I don't have this problem of legal with the state, illegal with the feds. Mm -hmm. And as long as I can get a license, well then I'm up for at least trying it because, uh, you know, I'm Dr. Reefer and uh, <laughs> I'm the one of the world's best marijuana growers um, and I've owned several dispensaries. So I know how to run these businesses. You, you know, know, and if I could break in there for just a sec, this is part of, of the continuing insanity of uh, these regulations because you have people who are uh, knowledgeable, who are experienced in this business, who've been practical hands-on working in it and as they develop these regulations they shut people like you out they right. say that you know if you if you have a, a criminal record you can't be part of this and so what they're really saying is okay we're gonna turn this business over to the people who were either criminals but low profile enough that they didn't get caught or, yeah. or well connected enough that they didn't get prosecuted or we're gonna turn it over to Business people who nothing, know nothing about pot, know nothing about this industry, and and who just say the right words and fill out the right forms, and yeah. it, it it just strikes me as a complete waste of the resources that people have spent years and years developing to shut them out of these businesses. So it is, but I'm beyond that now. I'm looking at fully legal, where I cannot be prosecuted for anything, and you know it was fun in my 30s, man. You know the Metro would raid down one of my grow houses. I'd go put up two more, you know. So that was all fun and games. But now for me to invest my money uh, into something, I don't want the government to have any capability of coming in and taking everything and putting me in prison. It's mm -hmm. just not worth it to me anymore. You know, I'm looking to build a huge company, something uh, that's going to carry on, you know. And I'm looking at uh, marijuana sodas, concentrates, uh, medicines that, you know, you can sell, export to other countries. Mm -hmm. And that's why I went to Colombia. And spe speaking of Colombia, we were talking about some of the, the South American countries and uh, how they're moving towards legalization. Uh, I have a story here, uh, once again, from Derek Stanton news uh, from the 14th saying that Juan Manuel Santos, who's the president of Colombia, recently used his Nobel Pr Peace Prize acceptance speech to, as an opportunity to call for the world to rethink the war on drugs. Nice. Santos said it was time to change our strategy on drugs and that Colombia has paid the highest cost in deaths and sacrifices in the so-called war on drugs. And so he, he's not saying here that we have to legalize marijuana. He's calling for a greater uh, repeal of drug prohibition, just as, as you were saying a little earlier in the program. So it seems that, that you know, in a, in a country that is, is considered the heart of the drug war, you know, for, for decades, you know, Colombia, you know. And it is ridiculous, Mike. You have all these people on almost every street corner in the tourist indus industries or tourist areas uh, wanting to sell you cocaine, uh, heroin, marijuana, whatever the hell you want. So they know that this is a joke. This is ludicrous. It needs to be regulated, taxed, and put into stores. So you're saying that, that uh, on the streets uh, in Colombia that there's not a, that kind of uh, stringent enforcement? That, that we would, I'm, I don't know. I haven't been there. Okay. I'm going to take you to Colombia one of these days. Okay? Uh -oh. if, if, if Get ready, John. We're going on a road trip. Hopefully, um, because I'm waiting on the regulations to come out in Colombia, mm -hmm. and that will determine if I go back. But there's this area... Mike in uh, Bogota. It's called uh, Barrio Santa Fe, and they call it a uh, zona of tolerancia. And zone of tolerance. Huh? Zone of tolerance, and it is a like a ten to twenty square block area that just anything goes, man. It is wild. I've <laughs> never seen anything like it. Like my taxi driver took me through there. And I wanted to film, you know, because it was so wild and, and crazy. And he's like, no, don't do it, man. They'll see that, and they, they could probably shoot at the taxi. Wow. I was like, okay, cool. But oh, I, I, don't know, I don't know if that's, that's where I'd want to spend my time. No, no, no. no. It, it's, it's not like that, Mike. It's not like that. But it's, 
like it wasn't that dangerous right but uh it was wild mike you've never seen anything like so that. so what do you think that um that columbia uh offers someone with with your talents and and in so the there, there's going to be like five different licenses mm -hmm. growing license exports yeah, that's the one thing too, export. That's the only country in the world that's gonna allow export. There's concentrates, there's seeds, and then there's, um, I think, uh, the medical other stuff. Well, and you were saying export, you're, and, and Colombia is, is preparing regulations for, so they will export medical marijuana Correct. to any other country that has that's been legalized that has federal. medical marijuana laws in it you yeah. know uh you know so that that's a very forward thinking thing but, very but forward. the, the only time, country in the world but at the same time you have people like uh, uh kim.com down in uh in um uh, new zealand who had mega upload and mm -hmm. was this big online pirate and even though he was doing something down there which was legal the u.s government didn't like it and they were able to raid him or, or convince the new zealand authorities to raid him and or our intent on bringing him back to trial in the u.s so I think how, do you get, how do you get around uh, you know a, the a, u.s federal government a, you don't send anything to uh, to the u.s to the u.s well, because you can't it's that's, illegal under federal law that, that's an but easy under answer. other in other countries where it's legal federally, you'll be able to. There's only like seven or eight of them at this current time, but it's coming. So you think you're thinking that the upcoming legalization of cannabis then is a uh, is an international game? Oh yeah, definitely. It's only it destiny requires legalization of all drugs, not just marijuana. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. And I've been so on the fence for this for a long time because I look at drugs like crack and meth and everything and say, oh my God, they're horribly destructive. But in, in the long term, I can use prohibition and thanks. Uh, prohibition and the drug war, I think, are a lot more dangerous yeah. to the country than any individual drug use. And uh, with that thought, uh, our time is about up for this week. Um, uh, we will Trust see me. You. We're doctors. We know what we're talking about. He's a doctor, uh, sort of. Uh, so anyway, Dr. Have, a, have a very, very happy holiday, and uh, we'll catch you next week.